In the face of despair, the people of Atlas continue to stand against a seemingly unending force, trying to push back the darkness, while others head directly into it in an effort to save their friend, and in the process come face to face with the witch. With that being said, I will say spoiler warnings for those who have not seen episode 9 of Ruby Volume 8 just yet. I will not be showing the episode or any clips from it in this video, simply images of the episode and analyzing the events that take place. I will leave a link in the description below so you guys can go to Rooster Teeth first, watch the episode there, and support the series that we all love. Now, the episode begins back on the battlefield, and we see how the Atlas military is holding up against the Grimm. They are able to hold the line, but we see a number of soldiers that have fallen on the battlefield, with hordes of Grimm continuing to come from the whale, stepping over their bodies. Hordes of Grimm, including one of the Sulphurfish, the Grimm that won the art contest a while back. We had seen it previously in the volume, a couple of them were spawning from the black pools that the whale was spitting out, but this is the first time where we've seen a good number of them on screen quite clearly. And this is a Grimm I'm definitely going to keep my eye on moving forward throughout Volume 8 and the rest of Ruby, because according to its concept art, it can combine into a larger form and likely much more dangerous and difficult to kill. Because not only would this form be a lot stronger, but you'd still have to kill every individual sulfur fish that's a part of it, unless they're going to overwhelm you. So yeah, this Grim is probably one of the more dangerous ones to watch out for. Unlike a Beowulf, where dealing enough damage will deal with the entire thing, the combined form of the sulfur fish will, uh, well, just lose part of it and have the rest of the sulfur fish you'd still have to deal with. So definitely looking forward to seeing what's coming with that. And then we cut to inside the whale, where Jean, Yang, and Ren have been able to make it inside. And now they just need to find Oscar inside this massive thing. Luckily though, Ren's semblance has just evolved, and he can now sense the emotions of others. By projecting his aura outwards, he can sense where the emotions are coming from inside something as massive as the whale, while also likely drowning out all of the emotions coming from the battlefield right now. That can't be understated how impressive that is, that he can project his aura outwards that much and have such control over it to selectively drown out certain emotions or certain areas of emotions, etc. In terms of aura projection and aura control, I think Ren might be at the highest caliber we've seen thus far in the Ruby series, so I'm curious to know how much further he can progress. At this point, he can't actually differentiate between the emotions, like determine what emotions are coming from what person, but it's still impressive nonetheless. He knows at least what direction to head, and Jean offers to help him by boosting his aura, to which Ren happily agrees. I'm really happy to see that Ren has calmed down after reaching this clarity, with his semblance fully evolving, and not having to be as agitated as he was throughout, well, all of Volume 7 and the first half of Volume 8. This started right when he got to Atlas. I made a theory video about this a while back, that by getting to Atlas, having his own emotions kind of heightened at that point, as well as seeing all of the emotions coming from Mantle and Atlas, all that negativity was affecting him, and his semblance evolution started at that point and just completed in episode 7, so now he's able to calm down and not be as on edge. So I'm really happy to see that everything is starting to work out. I hope this isn't a death flag for him though. I really don't want any member of Team Juniper to die, I don't like the Juniper death theory, so please, please don't let that happen for Ren, Nora, Jean, any of them. But then we cut to Oscar, who's also not really in uh, great shape and possibly in danger of dying as well. He is talking about another fairy tale, saying she brushed off her bumps and bruises, but nothing hurt worse than the loneliness she felt in her chest. This being a quote from The Girl Who Fell Through the World, a fairy tale that Oscar seemed to fantasize about, and one that Ozpin recognizes. Perhaps this is hinting at a fairy tales of Remnant Volume 2? We can hope, at least, and likely this fairy tale is talking about Salem as well, given the themes presented in it. You know, a lonely girl who can brush off physical injuries? Sounds like Salem after the God of Destruction wiped out humanity. That would seem like an entirely different world, or even when the second coming of humanity happened and Salem was the only member of her previous race left, ostracized as a witch which, you know, considering the name of this episode is exactly that, it would kind of be very fitting. As Oscar talks to Ozpin, he was reminiscing about how he dreamed of going to a different world just as the girl had in this fairy tale, and was always curious why she was so sad upon finally returning home. 
but now he understands. As Ozpin pointed out, she wasn't the same girl anymore by the time she got back. And this is going to be especially true for Oscar. If he ever gets the chance to return home, to the home that he left back in Mistral, he's not going to be the same person anymore. As Ozpin suggests maybe it's time for them to make their escape, Oscar doesn't want to use magic to do so. Without their cane, that would be their only option, and Oscar points out every time that he uses magic, he can feel their souls merging more and more, something that he's not ready for. But before they can actually take any action, Hazel shows up and grabs Oscar, taking him away from his prison cell. We then cut back to the battlefield, where we see Team Funky geared up and ready to go into the war. We also see the Aesops there fighting on the front lines, and then every one of those soldiers, including Team Funky, is ordered to go over the top. Which, you know, if you know anything about history, when that happened in World War I, going over the top in the trenches was pretty much a death sentence. Being sent out there against the hordes of enemies that were there, in this case the Grim, that is uh, pretty terrifying and honestly would take a lot of courage to be able to do. Mero is standing there watching this happen, and he makes the comment that they're just kids. Elm then comes in and tells him, right now we have to focus on fighting, and in this case, yes, Team Funky are still children, but they are, at the very least, third years at Atlas Academy, if not fourth years. They're still studying at the Academy, and considering they participated in the Vital Festival Tournament back in Volume 3, they were likely first or second years to be in their third or fourth year now, so they're at the very least 19 years of age. They are adults, and they did choose to enroll at the Huntsman Academies. Now, granted, they didn't sign up to fight in a war, and didn't know about Salem's existence at the point in which they signed up to be huntsmen and huntresses, but still, you know, defending their kingdom at this point makes complete sense, given that if the army was to lose otherwise, the Grim would just overrun the city, but I can still understand Mero's sentiment. And then we go back to Hazel, as he brings Oscar to where the Relic of Knowledge is being kept, wanting him to call upon Jin. Hazel thought this through quite well, actually. If Oscar had lied to him about the information, and Hazel brought that information to Salem, Hazel would be punished before Oscar would be. But if Oscar was telling the truth, however, then Hazel might be making a few uh, different decisions for his future. At that point, Emerald arrives, and she and Hazel watch Oscar call upon the relic. And upon him summoning the naked lady that is Jin, Hazel and Emerald do a bit of a reevaluating of their situation. Hazel immediately decides that he needs to get Oscar, and in that case Ozpin, as well as Emerald, away from the whale and out of Salem's grasp. Unfortunately, they can't bring the Relic of Knowledge with them, because the moment they move it, Salem's going to be alerted, and admittedly Jin seems a little bit peeved that no one has a question for her, but as Hazel, Emerald, and Oscar turn to leave, Jin gives a sly smile as she looks to the right of the door in which they are exiting. The walls have eyes and ears, after all, though they can't speak as Neo walks out ready to claim the relic for herself. I'm really curious to see how that's all going to turn out, because Neo can't actually summon the relic, and I don't know what she's going to do with it. By taking it, that's going to put a huge target on her back as Salem wants the relic of knowledge, but if Neo is able to access the relic, to summon Jin by getting someone else to do it for her, or something along those lines, I wonder if she's going to ask a question about someone that we've been hoping, or at least I've been hoping, is going to come back for a while. You know, maybe at some point in uh, Volume 8 we might see the return of Roman Torchwick. We can hope, at least, or perhaps Volume 9, or something along those lines. After this point, we cut back to Jean, Yang, and Ren as they are making their way through the whale. Jean is getting exhausted having to boost Ren's aura because he's not only masking all of their presences, but also projecting his aura outwards to try to locate where all of these emotions are coming from. So instead, Jean says, you know, don't worry about the masking at the moment, just tell me what direction, I'll go ahead and scout a bit, and so he does so. And Yang then comments that she's happy to see Jean and Ren being friends again. Ren then turns to Yang, saying that she doesn't need to hide her fear behind jokes. He can see that she's afraid. Both of them are. But Ren does comment that Jean isn't at all afraid, that he believes with all of his heart that they will succeed in their mission. 
a little bit naive given where they are right now and who they're going up against, but I feel like Jean's unwavering hope is going to have a pretty profound influence on a number of things in the plot of Ruby. Quite frankly, I think someone with that outlook would be the perfect person to wield the Relic of Destruction. But, you know, after that little conversation, Jean quickly comes running back, saying that they need to hide and for Ren to mask their presence, as a Seer Grim rounds the corner. Ren does struggle to mask their presence, and although the Seer Grim does pass them, his aura breaks, it is able to sense their emotions, and raises the alarm. Which also raises a question in my mind that Emerald was able to sneak past a Seer Grim with her semblance in the past. If the Seer Grim can simply sense emotions, or perhaps it has 360 vision and that's how it sensed Jean, Yang, and Ren, so you know, I'm curious to see how this all worked, but if the Seer Grim sensed their emotions because Ren stopped masking them, or sense their negativity, their fear, etc., then Emerald Semblance, being able to mask herself from a Seer Grim using hallucinations, could also mask emotions in some sense as well. Possibly. I'm curious to know if this was only vision-based that the Seer Grim saw them or sensed them, or if it did have to do with their negative emotions, because that raises a couple questions. And speaking of Emerald, we see her walking alongside Hazel, who seems a little bit different than he normally does. He's concerned about someone being on their own, and at this point we're left to assume that it's Oscar that they allowed him to escape on his own. But it's becoming increasingly clear as Salem walks down the hallway and Hazel looks absolutely terrified upon seeing her and has no idea how to respond to Salem that something is certainly different about Hazel at this point. As Salem starts to give him a curious grin, the alarm sounds within the whale, and she realizes that the relic is in danger. So she takes off Naruto running, or I guess Naruto gliding across the ground, and allowing Hazel and Emerald to go try to find the intruders. The intruders in question being Jean, Yang, and Ren, and as they defeat a couple Grimm, they vow to keep moving forward. Jean actually says that phrase, a phrase frequently spoken by Monty Um, at least so I've been told. And so it's a great tribute to him to have this included in the series. After this, we cut back to the battlefield, where we see everyone still fighting against the Grimm as the payload arrives, the bomb that they plan to deliver inside the whale in an effort to destroy it. Mero then looks towards the whale, wishing for his friend Jean to be okay. Or, as Mero calls him, Juan. And to be fair to Mero, Jean never actually corrected him back in Volume 7 as to what his name actually is, so I'm not really surprised that Mero thinks that Juan is his actual name. But still, I'm happy to see Mero caring about him because Jean and him were kind of buddy-buddy throughout the course of Volume 7. And then we cut to Inside the Whale, where we see Jean, Yang, and Ren encounter Hazel and Emerald. Only for the Hazel that they encounter, not actually to be Hazel, but to be Oscar instead which was kind of predictable given Hazel's reactions to seeing Salem, etc. But what the real important thing to notice here is Emerald was creating these hallucinations with her semblance, being able to have this up constantly and pretty much create a field around herself where everyone within it was affected by her hallucinations. When she said to Cinder that she had been working on her semblance and improving it, she wasn't kidding. She was just walking with Hazel, and as Salem walked up, she didn't have to activate the hallucination. It was constantly active, even though she wasn't focusing on a specific person. Salem walked up, the hallucination was already active. Jean, Yang, and Ren walked up, the hallucination was already active. They believed they were seeing Hazel. And Emerald was able to affect all three of them without anything out of the ordinary, with her having a headache or anything like that. Her semblance has improved drastically, to the point where she's nearing the level of Neo semblance, which is terrifying to think of that there's going to be two people at that level, which would be very interesting to see if they fought against each other, but that's a, that's a different topic entirely. Jean then attacks Oscar with a hug, the same thing that Oscar feared in episode 1 of volume 8 when Nora came to him with a hug. So it seems like Jean's the more aggressive hugger, and considering that Oscar has just been through torture, it seems kind of cruel of Jean to do that, but you know, Jean's just happy to see his friend. They see that Emerald is with him, and of course, they don't trust her, but Ren being able to sense emotions sees that she's just as afraid as they are. And she also knows the most efficient way out of the whale, so they decide to trust her, though they're probably keeping their guard up at that point. 
but with Emerald's hallucinations, you know, I don't know how well that would actually work. Still, they're all traveling together at this point. And then we cut back one final time to the battlefield, where Mero is talking to Winter, asking for more time for Jean, Yang, and Ren inside the whale, to not deliver the payload just yet, but Winter is saying, no, we're going to deliver it on schedule. And Mero counters with, what if this was your sister? What if she was in there? Are you going to tell her what you did to her friends? And Winter is resolved with her orders. And at this point, I kind of agree with Winter, because Jean, Yang, and Ren were the ones who volunteered for that, all the while knowing that the bomb is going to be delivered once it's there, no matter what. Right now, every minute that that whale stays alive, more soldiers are dropping dead. Technically, Jean, Yang, and Ren are fugitives of the Atlas military, so I can completely understand this from a militaristic point and a strategic point, because if they don't deal with this whale, or the bomb gets destroyed before they can get it there, it's going to be a very bad situation. So I completely understand Winter's decision, and Mero, you know, I understand where he's coming from too, wanting to save his friends, but there's still, you know, a little bit of back and forth here. The many versus the few, that entire argument, so definitely a difficult situation for anyone to be in. And then we go back to the whale as Jean, Yang, Ren, Oscar, and Emerald are about to make their escape. They have gotten to the, one of the platforms at the edge of the whale, but are stopped by Salem herself. The whale shakes, the wall breaks open, and Salem sees that Oscar has escaped and that Emerald is helping them. She, of course, jumps right to the conclusion that Emerald is at fault, so Salem goes and grabs her. Ren tries to attack in response, but Salem just blasts him with magic. Jean jumps in the way, and his shield is surprisingly able to block it, so the shield that Jean has is magic resistant to some extent. They're still knocked against the wall, and Jean's aura does break, but Yang then gets the chance to step in and uses her remote detonation to put a couple rounds into Salem and then detonate them. And with that being the case, Yang is the first member out of Team Ruby or Team Juniper to not only damage Salem, but technically kill her, I guess, because that amount of damage blowing someone's chest wide open would be enough to kill a normal person. Too bad Salem's immortal, and before her chest wound even starts to heal, she's able to reach out, grab onto Yang, and pull her right close to herself. At this point, Oscar attacks with his own magic, but that's kind of weak in comparison, or at least it looks weak in comparison to Salem's, and so it can't really do that much good. Salem then summons grim arms from the floor, pinning each of them down, and pushes Emerald against a wall where the hands come out and grab her as well. It's worthy to note that these hands are the same hands that the Imp Grim had that's part of the Nukalavi, so... If Salem can just summon those at will, could she summon a Nukalavi at will? That would be pretty terrifying, but also a tangent to what's going on here. Salem thinks that Emerald took the Relic of Knowledge, but Emerald insists that she has no idea what happened to it. So Salem decides to believe her, and instead turns to Oscar, asking him why he keeps coming back, why he keeps interfering with her plans. And Yang is the one to speak up, asking Salem why she continues on this. She got hurt once in her past, and now she's creating this endless cycle of death and destruction. And so Salem questions, what exactly did I take from you, girl? Who exactly did I kill? And of course, Yang responds with Summer Rose, which Salem recognizes the name. The fact that not only does Salem recognize the name Summer Rose, but previously in Volume 7, she knew who Ruby was referring to by saying, Your mother said that exact same thing. So Salem knows Summer Rose by name and knows Ruby's relation to Summer Rose. So, you know, Salem knows Summer Rose on a personal level, it seems, which is terrifying to think about considering what we just found out about the Hound last episode. So... Yeah, I'm pretty sure Summer's alive to some extent. The hints are just piling up that she is, but um, alive may not be the right word for it, depending on what experiments Salem has been doing. So yeah, that's definitely a thing. But unfortunately, we don't get to hear more as Hazel then arrives. Salem tells him to take Oscar back to his cell as she turns to go and torture Emerald. As Hazel walks past her, Emerald looks at him with pleading eyes. Hazel picks up Oscar and whispers in his ear, telling him, no more Gretchens. That's kind of a threat and kind of telling him, make sure you keep this promise, as Hazel has now resolved himself to die here. 
allowing Emerald, Oscar, Yang, Ren, and Jean to escape. So, Hazel runs over and uppercuts Salem, giving the best screenshot of the episode, I must say, and sends her flying. Everyone is then released from the hands as Salem now has a new focus. She summons like a black wind underneath herself, essentially mimicking what the Avatar does in Avatar The Last Airbender. There's a lot of influences from Avatar in the Ruby series, and, you know, you can kind of see that in this scene, if they did draw influence from that, perhaps. Hazel then turns to face Salem, taking off his shirt and injecting himself with five different types of dust at the same time. Fire, lightning, earth, wind, and hard light, which is going to take a massive toll on his body, and I think just that amount of dust alone is going to kill him, let alone what Salem's going to do to him. He tells everyone to run, and Emerald is sad to see him make this sacrifice, but he turns to Emerald and smiles, and we can frankly see in his eyes that his body is already pretty much screaming out in pain if his semblance wasn't nullifying it, and is dying because of what he's doing to it. He then enters into the fight with Salem. As Salem fights with her magic, Hazel uses the raw dust crystals as well as the dust in his body to fight back against her. He slams a wind dust crystal into the ground to launch himself up to Salem, and he uses an earth and lightning dust crystal to combine them together and form like a giant sphere of rock and lightning as well as there's red pulsating through it, which of course would be fire dust, but he didn't have a fire dust crystal in his hand when he jumped, so maybe that's from the fire dust that was injected into his body, most likely, and then slams it into Salem, slamming her against the ground, and then he slams his fists into her, multiple times, into her skull, splattering the grim liquid that is supposedly now her blood everywhere. But even with her skull caved in, that doesn't slow Salem down. She's still able to summon the grim arms and hold Hazel up in the air. It seems that when Hazel first encountered Salem, when he killed her over and over again, and the longest break he got between the time that she was killed and revived was two hours, she was just toying with him that entire time. She could have instantaneously regenerated. Even with her skull caved in, she re regenerates in like a few seconds at most. She was toying with Hazel, playing with him, and breaking his spirits, which we knew already by her just being there and allowing herself to be killed by him over and over because she could have overpowered him at any point, but it seems like even just the amount she was letting him rest was her toying with him. Salem is just, well, incredibly overpowered, as if we didn't know that already. Salem then goes to blast Hazel again, but he uses the hard light dust crystal in his hand to create a shield as he's thrown into the wall. Oscar decides to stay behind, as he lets Jean, Emerald, Ren, and Yang escape. We don't actually see Jean escape, so presumably he might have stayed behind, but as we see Oscar in the next scene, Jean isn't behind him, so presumably Jean left as well. Oscar, now holding his cane, the long memory, activates it. The dials begin to glow yellow as Salem turns her attention towards him. Hazel then grabs Salem from behind, and Salem then activates the grim arms from the ground to wrap around Hazel's neck and strangle him in the process. He pulls a fire dust crystal from his mouth and ignites it, lighting himself and Salem on fire, quite literally burning the witch, and then telling Oscar to go ahead and fire upon them. So Oscar charges up his cane, we see the magic, the green sphere that we saw at the end of Volume 7 appear around him, and he's building up his power to attack. This is where the episode ends, and um, oh boy, things are going to get real interesting. Because the long memory itself, we know from the Volume 3 DVD commentary that the long memory's abilities all revolve around storing time. Or at least, storing time is one of the main abilities of the long memory. Which means, at least the way that I've always thought of it, is that Ozpin sacrificed himself at the end of Volume 3 to store the remainder of his time and presumably a portion of his magic within it. This is what Oscar tapped into while falling from the city of Atlas at the end of Volume 7, and is tapping into at full force here. So, this is going to be a pretty intense magic battle, presumably next episode, possibly two episodes from now, if next episode cuts back to, well, Ruby, Weiss, Blake, Nora, and Penny at the Schneem Manor. So, with all of this going down, 
And especially with what Oscar said earlier this episode, the more that he uses magic, the more he can feel his and Ozpin's souls merging. Well, he's about to go full force with his magic. Does that mean that by the end of this battle, I guess not necessarily the next episode, but this battle and the end of Volume 8, Oscar, as we know him, is not going to exist anymore? That's uh, something that I'm really curious to see. By the end of the series, I always kind of thought that when Salem and Ozpin are released from their curses, Oscar might remain. But if their souls merge completely, I don't know if there's going to be a way to separate them. The God of Light and God of Darkness would probably have the power to do so, considering they can revive people from the dead with just a flick of their hand. So, you know, we'll see how things end up playing out, but I'm really curious to see how much and how large of a scale of a magic battle is actually going to take place. As well as Hazel's going to be there with all of the dust injected into his body, which is probably going to kill him. I don't think there's any way for Hazel to survive unless someone's there to give him medical attention, but I don't think that's going to be the case. So Hazel might be the first major death of Volume 8. If I'm being honest, I kind of thought Emerald was about to die this episode. When Salem arrived, I thought she was going to just immediately impale Emerald. But she does have a useful semblance, so keeping her alive, torturing her to kind of keep her in line might be a smart way to go about things, especially since Salem's kind of losing a number of her underlings at this point. She already had written off Dr. Arthur Watts, and, well, Cinder is not exactly obedient, her hound's now dead, well, this episode, Emerald and Neo have now defected, as well as Hazel, so Salem is really only left with Tyrion, and maybe Cinder, depending on what state she's in by the end of this volume, if she's still loyal to Salem, or what have you, and I guess Mercury, but now with Emerald's defecting, we'll see how all of that turns out. And speaking of Emerald, I'm really curious to see what she's going to decide to do after escaping alongside Jean, Yang, and Ren. Because, um, well, is she going to join up with the main group? That would be incredible. I honestly thought if she was going to defect from Salem's faction, she would kind of defect on her own and be kind of a third party, possibly even just abandon the fight against Salem entirely, or join in at some point as just a third party, not necessarily following Ozpin, but I'm completely for the idea that she joins up with Team Juniper. With Oscar staying behind, Team Alpine might not actually be a thing, and so they'll need a new team name. I kind of took the liberty of looking up what uh, different team names could be possible, and there's there's two that seem quite nice for uh, Jean, Ren, Nora, and Emerald. Because, of course, Yang is staying with Team Ruby. But still, if they form a team together, assuming Jean is still the leader, there's Team Jungle, which could be nice, or just Team Arson. The actual color associated with it would be Arsenic, but I like Team Arson or Team Jungle the most out of the ones that I found. So yeah, I'm all for them making a new four-member team, but if they do do that, then that means Oscar probably won't be part of that team anymore, which means something bad's gonna happen to Oscar. Yeah, this volume's definitely gonna be dark depending on how things play out. So with that all being said, let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Where do you think Neo is going to take this relic? What decision do you think Emerald is going to make at this point? How do you think the battle between Oscar and Salem is going to turn out? It's kind of sad that, you know, Jean, Yang, and Ren only went into the whale to rescue Oscar, but are now having to leave without him. They did pick up one person, at least, being Emerald, but I don't even know if she's going to stay with them and fight alongside them, so a lot of questions to be had, including those about Summer Rose. Salem knows her by name, knows that Ruby's her daughter, etc. So, you know, a lot of revelations still yet to come in Volume 8, and I am really looking forward to it. Hopefully you guys have enjoyed this video, and if you did, make sure to subscribe and join the Guild of the Eternal Flame. Tweet me at PhoenixKnight7, and I'll see you guys in the next video.